Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you. That's so awesome. It is also Advent week number two. Last week was uh, all about hope. This week is all about peace. Isaiah wrote about the Prince of Peace in Isaiah chapter 9, and this is what he wrote. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, yes, a child was born, but so far, the rest of that hasn't quite happened in the way that we know that it's going to happen, right? There will be a government. He will rule and reign for a thousand years. He will bring peace to the earth. It's going to happen. But uh, we are so grateful that God came in the form of man and was born that night to a very humble family. And so we sing a lot of wonderful songs about that this time of year. Let's stand together. And we're going to sing a very famous song for all of us, all right? It says, Away in a Manger, all about the baby being born. All right, let's sing it out. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The Lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the and have a seat. What a great prayer to start Sunday morning, to start any day. Is there any way, Amy, we could get the beginning of that third verse up on the screen? Be near me, Lord Jesus. Those words are just so good. I hope you noticed them when you sang them. Be near me, Lord Jesus. I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. What great words for Sunday morning, great words for each and every day, great words for Advent season. On that note, good morning. Welcome to The Way. My name is Jimmy. So glad to welcome you uh, to worship today, all of you who are here at The Way's building, everyone joining us through church online. It's good to be in worship with you here at The Way. Our mission is developing disciples who declare and demonstrate a different way of life to a watching world. Hope you know God loves you. His deepest desire is that you would have a relationship with him that makes you different. And so we're glad that you're with us. Uh, on that journey today. Uh, Today would be a great 
Uh, now would be a great time to use the Waze app to complete your Connect card. Uh, we'd love for you to do that. That's the way that we know that you're here with us. If you're new to the way, though, we have a new program that we are piloting for the first time today. It's something called Text in Church. So if you're new to the way, this is your first time with us or just you're relatively new to our church. We're going to give you a little leeway today because here's the thing. If you text this, you'll get cookies, right? So now people who've been around for 10 years, we know if you're not new, right? But if you're, if you're relatively new, help us pilot this today. Text the word new to this number, 636-242-6644. Text those three letters, N-E-W, 636-242-6644. And uh, that way we'll know you're new. We promise all we will do is reach out, let you know how glad we were that you worshiped with us, and sometime this week bring you cookies. Isn't that great? Say, yeah, that's great. Awesome. And again, if you've been around for 11 years, I guess you can text new and just see what happens. Um, lots of great things happening in the life of our church, and most of them have to do with Christmas. Let me tell you about them real quick. Tomorrow night, guys, is our last Monday night men of the year. It's our poker night. If you have not registered for poker night, please do so today so we know how much pizza to order and how many, like, decks of cards we need and poker chips. By the way, if you have any of those things that we can borrow for tomorrow night, just text me and let me know that if you have a set of cards we can use or poker chips or anything like that because we need several of those. And uh, again, register. Let us know that you're coming. It'd be great to have you there. Uh, middle school and high school kids and parents want you to know that there's a meeting right after church today for church camp that's happening this summer. And this Wednesday night, is a free babysitting night here at the church. I believe today is the last day to register your kids for that babysitting night. So if you need a couple hours to, uh, you know, go shopping or, you know, take a nap or whatever it might be, uh, just drop your kids off Wednesday night, but you need to register for that today. And then, of course, our Christmas Eve schedule. I want you to remember those three worship gatherings, Wednesday, December 20th at 6.30 p.m., Sunday, December 24th at 2 and 4 p.m., and we're looking for about 25 more people to serve in guest services. So if you're willing to, to open a door at one of those services, to welcome people, to, to help us serve communion, any of those things. Some of you have been doing guest services for years. We love your help. Others of you maybe have never served in guest services and hospitality before. That's okay. We can teach you. It's not rocket science. Uh, we just want you to, to help us roll out the red carpet for all the people that we believe God's going to send our way. So if you're willing to help with that on one of our three Christmas Eve worship gatherings, uh, you can sign up for that under the Next Step section of the Waze app, and we, uh, we appreciate the help. So uh, why don't you stand as you're able, say hello to those around you, uh, find somebody you don't know, offer them the peace of Jesus. Welcome to the way.
song you know it's a great story behind that hymn and the tragedy that led to it and yet in the face of all that tragedy the author wrote the loss of family members no matter what's going on it is well with my soul isn't that amazing the psalmist writes in psalm 69 god you know how foolish i am my sins cannot be hidden from you don't let those who trust in you be ashamed because of me, O sovereign Lord of heaven's armies. Don't let me cause them to be humiliated, O God of Israel, for I endure insults for your sake. Humiliation is written all over my face. I love the first words of that. Lord, you know how foolish I am. My sins cannot be hidden from you. He sees everything we do. How many know that to be true? Like he sees everything you do. And yet, here's some good news. If you belong to him, guess what? He has forgiven you of your sins. Isn't that awesome? And But I love this, too. It says, don't let me cause others to be humiliated. God, help me to act in a way of while I'm walking with you and serving you. Help me to walk in that way so that I don't cause shame to my, to my church family. I don't cause shame to your name, that I don't bring disgrace to that. God, help me. Yeah, I make mistakes. Yeah, God, I, I mess it up a lot, and you see it all. Just help me, please, with the power of your Holy Spirit, not to walk in a way that brings shame and dishonor to you. Everything we do is an act of worship. Everything. And even now, when we bow our heads and we just confess our sins to the Lord, this is an act of worship. So let's do that together. Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to love you. We thank you that you first loved us. And God, we thank you that... Even though we do make these mistakes day after day after day, we know that because we belong to you, you have forgiven us of our sins, past, present, and future. We know that the power of your spirit is in us, propelling us forward to be the people that you want us to be. I pray, God, that in everything I do, that it would be truly an act of worship to you. That
that's why we gather here today. God, may we honor you this way. In Jesus' name, amen.
So hello again. Welcome to The Way. My name is Jimmy. So glad that you're with us for worship. Everyone here at The Way's building, 1404 Westmire Road in Winsville, Missouri. Those of you joining us through church online, want to say a special word of welcome to all of you who are new to The Way. It's my privilege to speak with you today. And before we get going with today's message, I want to remind you that now would be a great time if you're willing to share this worship live stream on your personal Facebook page so that we can spread the good news of Jesus to as many people as possible. If you're joining us today on Facebook or YouTube, we'd like for you to know that the best way to worship with us online is using the Waze app. Uh, just search the Way Church Winsville wherever you get your apps. Of course, our app is absolutely free. Once you've downloaded the Ways app, please complete your Connect card to register your attendance with us. And remember that you can also use the Ways app to follow along with today's message notes or take your own notes if you'd like to do that. So I want to invite you to stand as you're able today for today's main Bible reading. It comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. This is some of the most poetic language you'll read anywhere, uh, not just in scripture. Colossians 1, 15 to 23 says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the... Now, we've talked about this word before, before you say it with me. Remember, this is kind of the key word for the entire book of Colossians. So say the word with me like that. So that in everything he might have the supremacy... For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, and free from accusation. That's what Kevin was talking about earlier, right? Free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Go ahead and have a seat. Christmas is coming. It's sort of like the year builds up to this crescendo that is Christmas. And the default mode is that we tend to get overscheduled, right? Anybody overscheduled? We have to go to all these parties and events. Perhaps some of them we don't really want to go to, but we have to go to. Why? Because it's Christmas. Christmas can also be super stressful with the sense of financial pressure. We have all these people we have to share gifts with, and we've got to find a way to get everybody just the perfect present, and that can kind of feel like an enormous pressure. Anybody with me so far? If we aren't careful, our Christmas can quickly slip into chaos and stress. Say those two words with me, chaos and stress, except let's say them like they're bad words, like you'd want to say boo hiss afterward, right? Chaos, stress, yeah, bummer. And before we know it, we have missed Christ, the reason for the season. So what would it look like this year for your and my Christmas to be filled not with stress and chaos and pressure, but with meaning and peace and purpose and this sense of joy that not only fills you, but also spills over on to others? Now, what's interesting is that the church with a capital C, not just the way, but the church with a capital C, we have had a practice for 1,400 years to prepare so that we don't miss Christ at Christmas. And that practice is called, very good, you knew that? Oh, that was up on the screen, wasn't it? Advent. It's a season on the church calendar. Do you know the church has a calendar in one year, you walk through the entire story of Jesus. Pretty good idea, right? 
Advent is when we prepare for the coming of Christ, where we wait with great anticipation. It's designed to be four weeks, starts right after Thanksgiving. In other words, Christmas is not supposed to be a cold start. We're supposed to warm up to it. We're supposed to build up to it. We're supposed to settle down into this time of joyful waiting expectation. This is not the kind of waiting that we sort of dread, like being in line at the post office or the Department of Motor Vehicle. Rather, it's a joyful waiting, the expectancy that comes before an event that you are really looking forward to experiencing. And so you and I have two options. Option one, the default mode in our culture is those two evil words, say them with me, chaos and stress. That's where culture is going to take you if you let it. I hope you know, by the way, that the marketers have tried to hijack Advent, and you know how they do it. They push the shopping season further and further and further back every year. And so now we start shopping at what? Halloween? It's hollow thanksmas. But make no mistake, if you go with the marketers who are trying to hijack your advent, you're going to get a consumeristic, overscheduled, spiritually starved version of Christmas. That's option number one. Or you can intentionally choose a Christ centered Christmas. And we're going to help you with that. And so we're going to do it through immersing ourselves into one book of the Bible, and that's the book of Colossians. And at this point, you might be going, Colossians? The Christmas story isn't in Colossians. Oh, yes, it is. Because Colossians is perhaps the densest, the richest feast of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, is doing, and will continue to do in the entire New Testament. And last week, I taught you the fancy seminary word for who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, and that is the word Christology. Do you remember that, or that's up on the screen too? Yeah. If you want to know who Jesus is, the wonder, the joy, the beauty, the infinite well of life that Jesus is, you should go to Colossians. And that's where we're going to camp out this Advent and Christmas season. And part of our passage from Colossians today the author Paul puts in the form of a song. Why does Paul do that? Well, I want you to think with me for just a second about the impact of a song. All of us in this room, there are certain songs that when you hear them, what happens is you're transported back to a very specific moment in time. Am I right? And what it does is more than just take you back to a moment, it also actually shifts your state of being. It changes the way that you see things when you hear, I don't know, this song.
In the winter of the year 2000, during my freshman year of college, when I started dating a girl named Erin, as she would walk across the quad on campus, that was the song that I would scream out my third floor dorm room window <laughs> to serenade her. Ladies, I mean, how would you resist that? The rest is history. Every time I hear that song, it brings up all those feelings and all those memories. That's what songs do. And that's precisely what Paul is doing when he selects a song for part of what he pens in Colossians chapter 1. Paul is hoping to bring our hearts alive, and the song he sings is about the, and this is the key word for the whole book of Colossians. You remember that one word I made you say out loud? The song he sings is about the supremacy of Jesus. And the verses we're looking at today are the bridge of that song, a bridge about just how big our God is. Parents have this question they ask their kids a lot when they're little. Grandparents love to ask it too. This is the question they ask their kids and grandkids. You know what it is? You look at your kids and your grandkids and you say, how big are you? How big are you? And what's the kid's response? So big, so big. They put their arms out. I'm so big. Parents ask this to their kids because we know, we know the image they have in their mind of themselves directly correlates with how they live and how they relate to other people. And so we're reinforcing to them, you're so big because we want them to think in their minds of themselves getting bigger and stronger and independent because we know the impact that will have on the way they live. Now, you can't ask this question to everybody that way. It won't work. If your wife asks you, how do I look in this dress? Guys, you don't say, so big, because there will be no Christmas. You will be dead. <laughs> but in a way, this whole Advent and Christmas series on Colossians comes down to one question for you, and that question is, how big is God to you? How big is God to you? And the right answer to that question is so big. And here's why it's important, because the way you and I live is a direct consequence of the size of our God. Just like a kid's image in their head of who they are absolutely impacts the way they live, so too the image of God that you have in your mind radically impacts, I would say more than any other factor in your life, the way you live. Because the God that we meet in Jesus, who became this little baby, is actually an infinite God. And so we can't wrap our three and a half pound brain around comprehending him. And so what we have in our heart and our soul and our mind is this image of God. It's just an image of him. And it's created by a variety of things. There are a variety of things that influence your understanding of God. Your personal history your current circumstances, your religious upbringing, your family system, most profoundly, your relationship with your mother and your father. In fact, when you do what I do for as long as I've been doing it, you realize that half the things people say about God are actually things they're saying about their mom and dad. Because we can't help but project onto our image of God what our mom and dad were like. And so what I'm saying is that for all of us in this room, those of us worshiping online, we have this image of God, and unfortunately for many of us, it's just so small compared to who the real God is. There was this movie back in the 1980s called Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and if we had to give a title to the image of God that hangs in the wall of so many of our souls, it would be Honey, I Shrunk My God. And it has such a profound impact on the way you live. See, here's the truth. The real Jesus, how big are you, the real Jesus? The answer is so big. But the image of him that we have in our minds is like this. Can you see this online? This is little Jesus. I have a Jesus action figure. 
He actually came with bread and loaves. I kid you not. Now, it's kind of funny, but it's also kind of disturbing, isn't it? There's something, dare I say, sacrilegious about it. And you know, it's really not funny at all if this is the Jesus you live with. But let's be honest. We want a little Jesus that we can control. We want a little Jesus that's domesticated. We want a little Jesus that we can keep in our pocket. And then when there's a problem, I bring little Jesus out, and I shake the Jesus dust around, and I hopefully do the right rain dance with little Jesus to get what I want, right? And then I put little Jesus back in my pocket again. But there are consequences to living with a little Jesus. First, if I live with a little Jesus, I'm going to live in a constant low-grade state of fear and anxiety. Why? Because I'm up against circumstances that just feel considerably large and oppressive and difficult and challenging. And if my image of Jesus does not correlate with the real Jesus, then I'm going to look at my circumstances that appear so big, and then I look at... This little Jesus, and I'm like, well, what's he going to do? So what happens? I'm afraid. I'm anxious. There are consequences to living with a little Jesus. Second, if I live with a little Jesus, then when someone, say that word with me, when someone disapproves of me, I get twisted in knots. And that's why a lot of us actually dread Christmas. We have get-togethers with other people, and sometimes those people have a problem with us, and perhaps we kind of have a problem with them too. And so you're not looking forward to the gathering because it's going to get really complicated, and you're worried about what they think of you. And why is that? See, I know if I have a big God, how big is Jesus? So big. When I understand his love is so big and that he tells me who I am, then you know what? I don't care what other people think about me in a good sort of way. I don't need their approval. I don't have to have their validation to know that I'm valuable because I live for an audience of one and I have all the approval I need in a God who is so big. But if all I have is a tiny little Jesus, then I desperately need your approval. There are consequences to living with a little Jesus. Third, if I live with a little Jesus, then I'm going to find myself driven to, say those two words with me, perform flawlessly. For some of us, preparing for Christmas is like an Olympic event. And we feel like, man, i got to get the meal right, and i got to get the presents right, and I've got to get the decorations right, and I've got to go to all these meetings and gatherings, and why are we doing it? Because we think that our value equals our performance, and Christmas is the big event at the end of the year to improve our scorecard. But when you get that God is so big, and his grace is so big, and his unconditional love for you is so big, then you can actually rest. But when you shrink down Jesus, you offer prayers without faith, worship without awe, service without joy, and suffering without hope. A little Jesus syndrome is a misery and a tragedy. And so Colossians, particularly Colossians 1, 15 to 23 is an emphatic answer to the question, Jesus, how big are you? So big. And that big Jesus wants to give you and me a gift this Christmas, and it is the gift of God's, it's the word we've already said a couple times, it is the gift of God's supremacy. The book of Colossians is fascinating. I hope you're reading Colossians as we're going through this series, because as you will soon see, Colossians 3 and Colossians chapter 4 are incredibly practical. Paul is writing the Colossian church because, let's see, their marriages are jacked up, their parenting is dysfunctional, 
There's all this gossip and slander. Does that sound like anybody's ride to worship this morning? Oh, you didn't think that was funny. A little too close to home, I guess. And so then Paul goes on and he talks about how there's chaos in the workplace and there's tension all around. But what's interesting is Paul doesn't say, okay, let me help you fix it. Here are three secrets to marriage fulfillment. Boom, boom, boom. Here are the six keys to parenting. Here are the five steps to workplace harmony. Now, Paul gets to that stuff in chapters 3 and 4, but guess where Paul starts? Paul says, you know what the real problem is behind all those other problems? you got a little Jesus problem. And I'm going to get to all the practical advice. You're going to get all the wisdom and the understanding you need. But if that is going to happen, then we have to go back to the real source of the problem. And we have to get Jesus right. And as your view of Jesus expands, especially his supremacy, you're going to find that wisdom and understanding begin to flow in your life. But we are so tempted, especially at this time of year, to shrink Jesus down. You know how one false prophet put it. We see Jesus as the eight-pound, six-ounce, newborn infant Jesus in his golden fleece diapers. I want you to contrast that with what Paul writes. The Son is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation... For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. How big are you, Jesus? So big. And he's singing a song about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And anytime you say Jesus Christ, you have to remember, Christ is not a name. Christ is a title. Do you remember that? It's not like Jimmy Cooper, Jesus Christ, right? Like Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. Both mean God's anointed one, God's final king. Paul invites us to look at the vastness of creation, to consider the immensity of the universe, and that Jesus is the one who thought it up. He's the architect and the creator of it and the sustainer of it. Jesus is the cosmic king. And when you and I begin to comprehend the real Jesus, the real Jesus, not the little Jesus that I keep in my pocket, but the real Jesus, the cosmic king over all creation. The more you and I comprehend that, the more we realize that Jesus should be our personal king too. And when the image of Jesus that hangs in the hall of your soul begins to line up with the actual Jesus who is the cosmic king, then it's just normal and healthy to say, Jesus, would you be my personal king too? Paul persuades his readers by pointing back to creation. Imagine that you could get in a little ship and you could go out past the moon and go past our galaxy and literally go all the way to the very edge of the universe and then visualize that that vastness is like a tiny little marble in the hand of Jesus. How big are you, Jesus? So big. He created everything, visible and invisible. All of it created through him and by him and for him like a speck of dust in the palm of his hand. During the Christmas season in 1968, the whole world watched on television the Apollo 8 mission. And they were in this little tin can, and for the first time in human history, they were going to orbit the moon. They went to the dark side of the moon. That's for all you Pink Floyd fans. And they were further away from the planet Earth than any humans had ever been before. Can you imagine? 
And they saw for the first time the earth rise. In other words, on the horizon of the moon, they watched the earth rise. And astronaut Jim Lovell, who most of us know from Apollo 13, described it this way. We learned a lot about the moon, but what we really learned was about the earth. The fact that just from the distance of the moon, you can put your thumb up and you can hide the earth behind your thumb. Everything that you've ever known, your loved ones, your business, the problems of the earth itself, all behind your thumb. And how insignificant we really all are. But then how fortunate we are to have this body and to be able to enjoy loving here amongst the beauty of the earth itself. We went on Apollo 8 to learn about the moon, but you know, I learned about the earth and how small it is. James Irwin, who was on a later Apollo mission in the early 1970s, was also up, in the moon, up around the moon at the Christmas season. And you know how he described the earth? He said, it's like a fragile, beautiful Christmas ornament hanging against the vast blackness of space. And guess who created the ornament? Jesus, the cosmic king. And guess who's holding the ornament? Jesus, the cosmic king. How big are you, Jesus? I'm so big. And once you've imagined the vastness of creation and how Jesus holds it all in the palm of his hand, then you realize, hopefully, that your little problem, that little speck of dust in God's hand, God's got this. So you don't allow your chaos or your stress to miss Jesus the cosmic king. And so I want to ask you today to identify it. Start by identifying it. What is your chaos? What is your stress this Christmas season that you need to turn over to Jesus, the cosmic king? At this time of year, there's a lot of chaos. There's all sorts of stress. There's probably financial chaos and stress, emotional chaos and stress, relational chaos and stress. Jesus is the one who can bring order and beauty and life. But the key, it all starts with, I'm not going to settle for a little Jesus. Because a little Jesus is misery and tragedy. I'm not going to settle for the shrunk image of God in my mind that's made up of who my mommy and daddy were or my past religious upbringing. I want to know the real Jesus. Because if you have a problem right now and it feels bigger than Jesus, then you're not dealing with the real Jesus. He is sufficient. He is infinitely larger than whatever chaos and stress you're in the middle of. Your and my problems are a speck of dust on the marble-sized earth that is firmly planted in the palm of Jesus' hand. So whatever your chaos or stress is, lift it to him. Realize how small it is compared to the vastness of Jesus. And grant Jesus supremacy in your life. Because the way you live, the way I live, is a direct consequence of the size of your God. How big are you, Jesus? I'm so big. Let's pray. Most gracious God, we thank you so much for this Christmas season and the church with a capital C that invented the season of Advent to give us an opportunity to, to prepare for Christmas. God, we thank you for the Apostle Paul and the book of Colossians. We pray that you would grant us the wisdom to know what you're calling us to do with what we've just heard and the courage to faithfully follow you, God, wherever that takes us. God, I pray for all of us. If you're, if you're here today, if you're worshiping with us online and you would acknowledge that there are times in your life where you have been living with a little Jesus. <laughs> Would you just raise your hand right now? God, I pray for all of us who have made the mistake of living with a little Jesus that you would help us to 
to follow the Jesus who is so big that we would grant you supremacy in our life. Perhaps you're worshiping with us today and you'd like to, to receive that relationship with, the Jesus, with Jesus for the first time, the real Jesus, or renew your commitment to the real King Jesus. If that's you, I want to invite you to, to repeat this prayer after me. And as we're praying this prayer out loud, people of the way, would you repeat after me if you agree with it as well? Let's pray together. Dear God, I'm so sorry for the things in my life that are wrong. For all the times I've lived with a little Jesus. God, I thank you for the real Jesus who is so big. I receive him as Savior and Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Be supreme in my life. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and after he'd given thanks to God the Father, he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper was over, Jesus took the cup and after he'd given thanks to God the Father, he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It's been poured out for you and for the whole world for forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on those of us gathered here, those of us gathered through church online. Um, pour out your Spirit on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. Make them to be for us your body and your blood that we would be for the world, the body of Christ. By your Spirit, God, make us one, one with you and one with each other and one in mission and ministry to all the world until you return in your final victory and we feast God at your great heavenly banquet. We pray all this in the name of your son, King Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let me share just a couple of quick words of instruction. If you're new to the way, if it's been a while since you've uh, celebrated communion with us, I want you to know that all are welcome to share in this meal of God's grace and love and forgiveness. Uh, in just a couple of moments, when I'm done talking, you'll be dismissed a row at a time by a member of our guest services team. So if you come up here toward the front, we have a couple of communion stations where you can receive a piece of the bread. You can dip the bread into the cup. Our cup has grape juice in it, if that's helpful for you to know. And, and then you can eat the bread, return to your seat. If it's difficult for you to come forward, uh, just let a member of our team know that. We'd be happy to bring communion to you right where you are. If you prefer pre-sealed or gluten-free communion, know that that's uh, available at our middle station in the back of the room. So when your room moves, if you prefer pre-sealed or gluten-free communion, uh, you can just head to that station in the back. And uh, after we've received this incredible gift God has given to us, we'll give back to God our financial contributions, our offerings. We'll pass the, the offering basket through the room. We invite you to be uh, generous in light of God's generosity toward you and toward me. So the gifts of God have been made ready for the people of God. Come and taste and see the goodness and love of Jesus. Won't you come?
Would you pray with me? Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery of communion in which you give yourself to us. And we ask now that you'd help us to go out into the world in the strength of your Holy Spirit to give ourselves for others. We pray all this through King Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Forget who it was who came through the communion line and was like, well, that's a really big piece. But you got to remember, I mean, how big is Jesus? So big. He's so big, right? So big. Um. Communion should taste good, right? Particularly if you're going to do it every week. So I know we're drawing to the close of our service. I have a few things I'd like to share with you. Those of you who know the rhythm of our service know that we're almost done. You also know that this is a moment in our service where I often will share, like, something to celebrate. But I have three things I'd like to celebrate, and I promise I'll do them real quick. Who would like to hear all three? Raise your hand. And who would rather just get out of here? Okay. So the eyes have it. Number one. Christmas wishes. Well done, church. Um, You can clap for that, yeah. 20, so you should know because of your generosity, 29 families and 50 foster kids have been provided over 700 gifts. And uh, and see, that's what happens when you clap too early. You realize you want to clap again, don't you? So, um, again, just because of your generosity, that happens, right? Number two, Advent by candlelight. Uh, do I have a picture? Because I haven't. So, you know, I'm not invited to Advent by candlelight. It's the ladies only thing. What I hear about this past Tuesday night was that it was unbelievable. <laughs> that um, like 65 ladies were in this room and heard from an unbelievable speaker, Laura Sliger, who's uh, on staff at our Mother Church Morning Star, that the worship a team of our worship folks and their Morning Star's worship folks led worship in an incredible way. Um, again, just ladies, to all of you who helped pull that event off, thank you so much. And um, pray, again, that if, you, if there was a lady you invited to that event... Uh, again, if they have a church home, leave them alone, right? Pray that this event encourage their faith. But my guess is there were a few ladies at this event who don't have a church home. My hope is you'll reach out again to them to invite them to be a part of, of Christmas Eve here at the way. So uh, well done, ladies. Guys, I expect 65 of us here for poker night tomorrow night. We've got a high bar there. And um, number three, uh, and there's not an easy way to kind of say this one, right? Uh, Those of you who've been a part of the way for a long time know that we've been on this journey of exiting the United Methodist Church, that unfortunately the denomination we were a part of, we felt like they had kind of lost their way, that they were no longer committed to essential Christian beliefs, that they'd kind of become an overblown bureaucracy with no leadership. Again, I don't have time to get all into all of that today, but if you're new to the way, I'd be happy to talk with you more about that. But I mean, the the moral of the story is we've been exiting the, way, the United Methodist Church for some time now. We had a settlement agreement where we had to pay the denomination about $140,000, paid them the first 50 six months ago, owe them another 30 this month. So we've been raising some money. And so last Sunday, I shared with you that we had about $10,000 to raise, actually more like $8,000 to raise to make our next payment in December but that I was just a big believer that we should just raise the whole thing, right? That we only owe about $53,000 more to be done with this thing. So I shared that last Sunday, sent out a letter this week. If you didn't get the letter, please let us know because you should have gotten the letter if you call your way to church home on, on, in email. A family from our church during the course of this week came forward and let us know that of the 53000 we still owe, they are going to write us a $25,000 check. So now I... I appreciate the applause. I'd rather you reach for your pocketbook. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Our, our church voted overwhelmingly. To, I mean, we voted by 98% to leave the denomination, which meant we were all on board with this, right? So, again, I'm, like, I'm not sure. If one family in our church can do that, Right? My question to every person in this room is, what can you do? And I hope you know, like, again, I know for some of in this room, a dollar would be a big deal. So please give a dollar, right? Because what this family and what those of us who've given to the Freedom Fund want to know more than anything 
is that everybody in this church is on board with doing this. Otherwise, why did we do it in the first place? Does that make sense? Again, I'm, again I know this is a hard time of year, right? But that, the, the finish line is closer than it's ever been before. We have 102 families who give to the way consistently. If, so if every one of those families gave a one-time $280 gift, we're done. Now, again, I know the moment you hear that number, some of you think, man, 280 is way too much for us. Then don't give 280. Give 20. Again, give $5. Give $1. But communicate to the leadership of this church that you are on board, that you are a part of this, that you are a stakeholder in putting this behind us and heading into God's preferred future so that we can start 2024 with a clean slate and head into what we believe God has for us. Again, I hope that's, I hope you hear that in the right way. Um, yeah. So why don't you stand as you're able, and we'll sing the final song before we go. I did not know that this uh, weekend was going to be throwback weekend, you know, that we'd go back to big hair band days, or that we would go back to 1968, where most of you were not alive to see the landing. How many actually saw the moon landing live? Yes, I see those four hands. I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. But uh, we liked it. Last week we ended it evangelistically saying, hey, go tell it on the mountain. And so this week, not knowing what was coming up with Jimmy, um, I reached into the Wayback Machine. And I picked out a song that was uh, written in 1969. And it says, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. And soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God. Spread his love to everyone you want to pass it on. I love this next verse, and it should be uh, something that we all think. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I find. You can. So clearly I need to lead some singing stuff here at the church, right? Because I feel like there's a couple choruses that I'm aware of that other people just aren't picking up on. First of all, we need to practice our bad English. And then secondly, I remember at camp when we would sing that song. Anybody remember that? You would, you know, I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I've found. You can't depend on him. It matters not where you're bound. I'll shout it from the mountaintop, and then we would all yell, praise God. But when I just yelled that, I felt like I was the... I think that was oh. a Methodist thing. We didn't do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, okay. Just saying. Um... That's okay. That's uh, that might have been the newer ve- version. I'm the old version, yeah. so that might have well, been. Well, yeah, could be. I wasn't there in 1969 no, when it was written. No, obviously. So yeah. now, <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. it's okay. Hug it out, brother. Hug it out. Come on, tuck right, it in there. It. Okay, okay. I have a son older than you. <laughs> um. This, this is why we're here, right? Because we wish for the people beyond these walls the happiness that we found, right? This is good news. 
That's why we do Christmas wishes. That's why we do Advent by candlelight. That's why we do everything that we do, because we, we want every person within shouting distance of this place and to the whole world to know how much God loves them and to respond to that by loving God back, by being different, by being all in. So thank you again for all the things you do to be a part of that. And um, why don't you say today's blessing with me? God, we thank you so much for your presence with us in worship. Now help us to go out and be the church, declaring and demonstrating a different way of life. God, we know that apart from you, that's impossible. But with you, all things are possible. And so God, send us out with your grace, your wisdom, and your courage. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.